Good morning, Bob. It's an honour and a pleasure to be here with you this morning, although it's a shame that we can't all be here in Berlin. Uh, my name is Jeremy Gibbons, and I'm going to talk to you today about how I design programmes. So this was Mike Sperber's uh, suggestion of a title for me, and I have to say I'm somewhat embarrassed about it because it's uh, somewhat uh, arrogant and self-centred, but uh, more precisely, what I'm going to talk about is uh, continuation passing style and defunctionalization, which are two well-known techniques for transforming programs, in particular to turn interpreters into abstract machines. And I'm going to talk about the, uh, the use of associativity in uh, those transformations. So how I design programs is to think about their um, algebraic properties, so things like associativity, and how they um, equate different programs, how they let you turn one program into another program while preserving the meaning of those programs. And my argument is that there's associativity built into many uses of CPS and defunctionalization, but often not noticed, often overlooked. And I want to encourage you to uh, spot associativity and algebraic properties like it and uh, think about those while you're writing your programs. So here's a teaser um, for, for what's coming up. Uh, they, there's a data type of binary trees. So binary trees with labels of type A are either a tip or a bin. A tip has an A, uh, a single label, a bin has two children. And there's an example on the slide. And there's a simple program for flattening one of these trees to a list of elements. So to flatten a tip, which has a single element, you get a list with a single element. And to flatten a bin, you flatten the left child, you flatten the right child, and then you append the, uh, the two lists. Now, this is a straightforward and obvious program for flattening a tree, but it's not a very good one because it takes quadratic time um, because of left nested uh, plus pluses, left nested concatenations. You have to traverse the left tree to make a list out of it, and then you have to traverse that list again to append the traversal of the right tree, because the way lists are represented, in Haskell at least, is um, with consas and, and nils, so they are biased towards the head. So how can we turn this quadratic time program for traversal into a linear time program? And what has this got to do with abstract machines and interpreters? Well, that's the point of the talk. But let's rewind uh, to something much simpler so we get a better idea of what's going on. So this is factorial, uh, obvious factorial function. And of course, it's recursive because that's the way you would write it in a functional style. Um, continuation passing style transforms this program by introducing uh, what's called an accumulating parameter, k here. Uh, which is, as it happens, a function. It's a continuation. In some sense, it represents the rest of the computation. So uh, we define a new function, fact two prime, which takes an n and computes its factorial, and then, but also takes a continuation k and applies k to the result. Uh, so of course, if you start off with k being the identity function, then fact two prime computes factorial and finishes off with that. So we can define factorial in terms of fact two prime to start off with the identity continuation. And then if you, um, you can use the definition of factorial uh, and the specification that's on the first line of the slide to synthesize uh, a recursive definition of fact two prime from first principles. So fact two prime zero with some continuation k gives you one, which is the factorial of zero, and then apply k to that. And uh, fact two prime n with continuation k, you compute fact two prime n minus one, get a result, call it m, and then multiply n by m to get n factorial, because m will be the factorial of n minus one. Multiply n by m and then apply k to the result. So this program is now tail recursive in particular. So fact two prime is tail recursive. When fact two prime makes a recursive call, uh, the recursive call is the outermost thing it does. 
And this is good when it comes to implementing abstract machines because it's, uh, it is something you can turn directly into a loop. You can implement it with go-tos rather than needing to manipulate a stack. This, this is why CPS is connected to uh, um, interpreters and abstract machines. So it's tail recursive, but it's now higher order. We turned a program that was just about numbers into one that deals with more complicated things, uh, here functions. Fact2 prime has to accumulate a continuation k. So we've got rid of stacks and fancy things like that, but we've introduced functions, which is a different kind of fancy thing. That's where the, the second transformation comes in, defunctionalization. Uh, and the observation is that the continuations you come up with in fact two prime, they're integer to integer functions, but they aren't arbitrary integer to integer functions. There's no square roots in there, there's no exponentiation in there, there's no division in there. They're all functions of, um, of the following form, some composition of little multipliers, a times and b times and c times. So we could represent this, these continuations, these functions, just by plain ordinary first order data. Uh, so represent the continuation a times compose b times compose c times with the list a comma b comma c. Um, and if you install that data refinement, then you get this version of factorial fact three, where the continuations now are not uh, functions, they're representations of functions, representations just as lists of integers. And uh, the definition is then straightforward. Uh, once, when you make a recursive call, you add one more integer, uh, combine one more integer with the accumulator. So you just append one more multiplier to your list. And when you're done, you actually do all the multiplications with the, the function product. Product is a, in the Haskell libraries. It takes a list of numbers and multiplies them all together. So this is tail recursive as before, but now it's first order as well. Um, so it doesn't use fancy higher order features. However, it does still use data structures. So fact three prime uses lists. So you still need lists in order to implement this. And if you were going to write factorial as a loop, you know you don't need lists for that. You just need plain integers, scalar variables. So where does that final step come from? And that's where assertivity comes in. Uh, because we're the only thing we're going to do with these representations of functions, the, the list of factors, a comma b comma c, we're eventually going to multiply them together. We might as well multiply them together as we go, rather than just uh, saving all the multiplications for the end. So this is another data refinement. We're, we're going to represent the list uh, by its product. And this is not a, a faithful representation of lists. You lose some information about the list, but nevertheless, it's adequate for our purposes. And you can install this data refinement in the program and you get this fourth version of factorial. But if you work through the details, it's only a valid data refinement because of associativity of multiplication. And the, the same transformation wouldn't work if we'd had started off with something other than factorial that didn't use an associative operator like multiplication. So if you have a kind of subtractorial function rather than a factorial function that uses a subtraction in, in, instead of multiplication, subtraction is not associative, so this final step doesn't work and you can't turn subtraction into uh, a tail recursive first order scalar program that only uses a single integer. You need to do something a bit cleverer. But anyway, what we've ended up with here is a, a tail recursive first order scalar program for factorial, um, which is a, a tail recursive functional program, but it has an obvious translation, obviously corresponds to some imperative program, and that's shown on the right hand side of the slide. So you can, you can compile this to a loop. And it's these steps. Uh, that this talk is about. So CPS, uh, defunctionalization, and then appeals to associativity to tidy up at the end, if you like. You can do exactly the same uh, trick uh, on reverse. So there's a, an obvious, naive quadratic time program for reversing a list, uh, where to reverse a non-empty list x cons x's, you uh, put the head aside for the time being, you reverse uh, the tail of the list, 
and then you stick the um, head on the end of the list. But again, that takes quadratic time because you have to retraverse a list you've already constructed. Uh, we know we can reverse in linear time, and in fact that comes out through exactly the same steps. You can write reverse in CPS, in continuation passing style, you can defunctionalize it, um, and uh, in fact to do the defunctionalization uh, you need associativity. Um, uh, but once you've uh, applied associativity, then you get the familiar linear time uh, tail recursive version of reverse that's shown at the bottom of the slide. So this uses an accumulator K, which is uh, building up the reversal of the list. Each new head gets consed onto uh, K, and when you're done, that's the reversal of the list. Here's a more interesting example. So factorial and reverse are similar because they're, they're linear recursions. Here's one that's a non-linear recursion. So this is the program we started with in the teaser. So uh, flattening a binary tree, it's not tail recursive because when you flatten uh, a bin, you flatten the two children and neither of those flattens is, is the last thing you do. Certainly both of them can't be the last thing you do. Um, and therefore it's, uh, it, it's quadratic time. You re-traverse the flattening of the left child uh, to append the flattening of the right child. So let's go through the process again. Uh, we can turn it into continuation passing style by introducing accumulating parameter, uh, a function. So the interesting case is the last line, which is what happens for a bin tree, a, a non-leaf tree. Uh, you flatten the left child, t, get a result, call it x's, then you flatten the right child u, get a result, call it y's, then you append x's and y's and apply the final continuation k to the result. And uh, this is tail recursive, when you make a recursive call, uh, uh, the, that recursive call is the final thing you do, that recursive call gives you the final answer. However, it turns out that that program isn't going to give you a linear time uh, flattening. Uh, what you need to do is visit the right child before the left child. So in the previous program, we visited T, get a result, call it X, then we visit U. Visit left child, then visit right child. And that's the wrong order to get a linear time flattening. You want to visit the right child, then visit the left child. Um, so here's uh, a similar program, but one that visits u, gets a result, call it y's, visit t, get a result, call it x's, append x's and y's in the same order as before, so left tips come out before right tips, but we construct the right traversal before we construct the left traversal. And so this is a different CPS translation. Uh, the original program was agnostic about whether you visit left children before right children. Um, and one of the purposes of CPS is to make uh, explicit the order of traversal. So this is now a tail recursive program again, but it's still higher order because there are continuations in there and it's still quadratic because we still revisit lists we've constructed. So we can defunctionalize and it takes a little thought to think about how you defunctionalize these continuations because there are now uh, three ways of constructing them. Uh, the continuation you start off with is the identity function. The continuation when you uh, visit a left child um, is, uh, so on the last line there, when you, when you flatten t, the continuation is lambda x's arrow kx's plus plus y's. So x's is bound there by the lambda, but y's is free um, uh, and k is free. So to represent that continuation, we need two pieces of data, uh, y's and k. And uh, when you visit the right child u, the continuation is lambda y's arrow, all the rest of the definition. And the, uh, the y's is bound, but t is free and k is free. So to represent that, you need to, to hang on to the, the t and the y's. So those are the three ways of constructing continuations. And um, and the free variables in, in those expressions. And if you stare at this for a while, you'll see that these continuations are 
can, can be represented as sequences of things. So a continuation is either a, a Y, is a list, and another continuation, or it's a T, a tree, and another continuation, or it's no further information representing the identity continuation. So you can represent that as a list of uh, choices. Uh, the, the elements in the list are either list of A's or trees of A's. So in Haskell, we represent choices by the either data type and the continuation is a list of either's, a list of elements, each of which is either a, a list of labels or a tree of labels. And that representation is um, specified by an abstraction function, whose definition I'm going to omit, um, which turns that list of either's back into a continuation, a list to list function. But anyway, you can install that uh, definition into Flatten2 and you get the following program for flattening. Uh, you start off with the identity continuation, which is represented by the empty list. Um, when you go into a bin, you descend into the right child U and you push onto the stack the left child T to deal with later. Um, when you get to a tip, um, you pop something off the stack. So that's a call to flatten abs that looks at the stack and finds the next thing that you've postponed to do. Um, and if you pop off a, uh, if you were in the right child, then you pop off a right from the stack that gives you a tree T and you go off and visit that. Um, and if you, uh, if you were visiting a left child, if you've already visited the right child, so then you can pop off the result of the, the right child, you can append the left child to it and continue with um, the tail of the stack, continue with K. So I've given an operational reading of this program, but it comes out just by data refinement from uh, the CPS program. Sadly, it's still quadratic time, and to see why um, we need to look at what's going on, uh, here's a, a bigger tree um, with four subtrees in it, T1 to T4, and uh, let me refer to the flattening of each of those trees by, so X is 1 is the flattening of T1 and so on. And if you unroll the program, you'll see that when you're visiting a subtree, for example, T2 here, highlighted in the picture, uh, the continuation that's on the stack is the, the stuff, it's like the context for visiting T2. So uh, you'll have visited the right child T4 first, so you already have the flattening X's 4 of T4. That's the last thing in the list that is the continuation. Uh, then you'll go down into the left child. You'll put T1 aside for now and go into the, the, the right uh, sibling. So then uh, the, so the continuation has uh, the list X is 4 and the tree T1 in it. And then you'll go into the left child again, uh, having visited T3 and got a, a list out of that, X is 3. So now when you're visiting T2, um, you've got the rightmost uh, child X is 4, uh, a postponed left grandchild T1, and uh, a uh, an already traversed right uh, sibling, X is 3, uh, in the continuation. Then you visit T2, you get the flattening of T2, which is X is 2, and the overall result you return is, well, obviously it should be X is 1 plus plus X is 2 plus plus X is 3 plus plus X is 4. It should be the flattening of each of the subtrees in left to right order. Um, but the, the bracketing of that um, it comes out of the nesting of the tree. So you combine X is 2 with X is 3, then you combine X is 1 with that, the flattening of T1, then you combine X is 4 with that. But plus plus is associative, uh, so the bracketing doesn't matter. Um, it doesn't matter how those lefts and rights are interleaved in the context, um, whether it's all lefts and then all rights, or all rights and then all lefts, or some, some mixture of them, because all the lefts get appended to X as 2, and all the rights get prepended to X as 2, and because plus plus is associative, sticking something on the end and then sticking something on the beginning is the same as sticking something on the beginning and then sticking something else on the end. Which is to say, um, 
the continuation uh, is whatever the interleaving, it's that gives you the same effect as the, the continuation with all the lefts followed by all the rights. The, the relative ordering of the components is irrelevant. So that suggests um, a different representation where we just have all the lefts and all the rights stored separately. That's the context. And uh, if you install that data refinement, then you get a, a different program. Still quadratic, but um, uh, we can make a further step because uh, Oh, a further step here on this slide, um, because all the left things um, we're just going to concatenate together anyway, so uh, we might as well concatenate them as we go. Just like with factorial, we were going to multiply all these numbers together anyway, so we might as well multiply them as we go. So we don't need to keep a list of lists uh, and a list of trees, we can just keep the, a list of elements, which is the things to stick on at the right. And so that's the program on this slide, and if you, uh, it, it, you it, it's now um, linear time uh, because although you do revisit lists to append something onto the end of them, it's only singleton lists that you do that to. So those just turn into consas and they're constant time uh, operations. So this maybe still looks a bit of a mysterious program, but a bit more uh, refinement of this um, uh, yields the, the following program which is uh, tail recursive and linear time now. So, uh, and, and this is the program you might have written. So it maintains a stack of trees and a, a list of a list, which is the traversal it's building up. That's the accumulating parameter of the list. When you have a, a tip tree on the top of your stack, you just cons its element onto the traversal. When you have a bin tree on top of the stack, you split it up into two children uh, and you put T on the stack and then U on the stack because you want to visit U before T. And when you run out of things on the stack, then you, that you built up the overall um, traversal. So this, float, this pro flattening program is tail recursive linear time. It comes out of uh, continuation passing style and defunctionalization, but only by applying associativity. It was necessary to use associativity to get these data refinements that give you the linear time program. And incidentally, if you apply the same process to the identity function on trees, uh, the defunctionalized continuations you get are um, uh, lists of choices, lists of left trees or right trees, um, which is uh, Gerard Huey's zipper data structure, which is uh, a very convenient way of representing traversals over trees. Uh, so this is not flattening anymore, it turns a tree back into a tree again. So that's why there's no lists in that. So you do it to the identity function, you get the zipper. And if you do it to map on trees, what you get is Connor McBride's uh, clowns and jokers construction or dissection of the data type, which is tail recursive traversals that go through a tree and turn all the A's into B's. If you want to pause one of these things in the middle, um, then you've the things to the left you've already visited and turns into B's, but the things to the right you've yet to see, so they're still A's. So you've got some funny data type that is like trees, but it's a mixture of B's and A's. And you can represent that by this, uh, this list of either's. So the same construction explains that, that, that um, construction. So I want to go back now to um, abstract machines, and I'm going to use uh, Graham Hutton's device of a very simple um, expression language. Actually, it predates Graham by many, uh, many years, uh, but he's the one who's popularized it. So this is a little expression language. Expressions are either literals, which are just an integer, or the difference of two other expressions. Graham typically uses addition, but I want to emphasize that the binary operator here difference, subtraction, is not associative. So we're not going to get confused about where the associativity is coming from. It's obviously not coming from the, from the subtraction. So here's a little expression. It represents 3 minus 4 minus 5, uh, which evaluates to minus 6. Um, so if we turn the handle again, CPS uh, turns this uh, into, well, continuation passing style. You start off with the identity continuation. When you 
visit a diff. When you evaluate a diff, you evaluate the left-hand side, get a result, call it m. Evaluate the right-hand side, get a result, call it n. Compute m minus n, and then apply the final continuation k to the result. And when you get a lit, then you just apply k to the content of that lit. So this is tail recursive but higher order. We can make it first order by defunctionalizing. And like tree traversal, the, the defunctionalization, the continuations are these contexts for expressions. So when you descend into a left child, you've got the unevaluated expression, which is its right sibling to look after later. And when you descend into a right child, you've got the integer from the left sibling um, to be combined somehow later. So the continuation is a list of either's. And if you just plug uh, all those in with the data refinement, you get this, this evaluator, which is an interpreter for expressions, deals with a stack. Uh, the stack is the list of either's. You push things onto the stack and pop things from the stack. But it's not a compiler for expressions because the stack contains unevaluated expressions on it. And for a compiler, you'd want to get rid of all the expressions before you start doing any arithmetic. So we know that there's a, a nice stack-oriented uh, compiler for expressions. This is a, a, a very um, obvious implementation, kind of reverse Polish. Uh, so here's a, a data type of instructions. They're either push instructions or subtraction instructions. Uh, and the idea is that push pushes a value onto the stack and subtraction pops the top two values off the stack, subtracts one from the other and pushes the difference back onto the stack. So subtraction turns a stack of at least two elements into a stack with at least one element. So compiling our difference program will give us the program the executable code, the target code, push three, push four, subtract, push five, subtract. So there's a little compiler, which is structurally recursive over expressions and an execution engine that takes a list of instructions and a stack and gives you a new stack. And here's the implementation. The only thing to be careful about with subtraction, uh, subtraction is not associative, but it's also not commutative. So you have to be careful which way around you subtract one thing from another thing. Because we push the left child onto the stack and then the right child onto the stack, uh, when we pop them off, we need to flip the arguments. We need to pop off an n, then pop off an m, and then compute n minus n. And then evaluation has the effect of pushing a single value onto the stack. Well, executing a program has the effect of pushing the single value onto the stack. An evaluator uh, can be obtained by starting off with the empty stack, running the compiled code, getting a single thing on the stack, and returning that single value. But this program doesn't come in an obvious way from CPS and defunctionalized interpreter uh, because the interpreter is not a compiler. How can we get this program out of our, uh, in, uh, out of our interpreter? So Graham has spent quite a long time thinking about this and has got some nice papers on calculating compilers that use this example. Um, but I'm, I'm disappointed with his papers, I mean, they're very nice papers, don't get me wrong, but I'm disappointed because he, uh, if you like, pulls rabbits from hats about the stack. Uh, so the paper says the next version is to introduce a stack in order to make manipulation of argument values explicit. And not only that, he has to int introduce um, stack transformers as well, uh, which make the flow of control explicit. And it's disappointing to have to motivate those operationally because as we've seen, uh, continuation passing style and defunctionalization invent the stacks for you. Uh, you shouldn't have to scratch your head and think and say, well, now we need a stack. That should come out of the calculation. Uh, and indeed it does, but as you might guess, um, some associativity is required. And the trick is uh, actually already um, prefigured by Mitch Wand in a paper from a very nice paper from 1982, uh, front page here, deriving target code as a representation of continuation semantics. Uh, and the trick is a generalized version of function composition. So here it's written with B subscript R, sorry, superscript R. Uh, B is composition and the R is the arity. So the composition of two things G and F 
is, is like G F to F, it's like the composition of G and F normally, um, but instead of just applying to one argument, X it applies to R arguments. So pictorially, uh, F is a box that takes R arguments and produces one result, and then G uh, does some post-processing on that one result. Um, and here's, uh, so there's a inductive definition of uh, arity R comp uh, composition uh, inductive over the R superscripts. Uh, now, the type of um, uh, this generalized composition is, is hard to capture, and Mitch Wan's paper doesn't give it a type. It's all done in an untyped, schemey kind of setting. Um, you can capture it uh, in fancy uh, modern Haskell or other, uh, there are other languages available too, um, using lightweight, dependently typed features. And I'm going to skim over uh, how that works. Um, but you can do it with a type family um, of uh, arbitrary arity functions. So this, this type family arrow is parameterized by a list of types, a type level list of types and a type. Uh, so type level lists in Haskell are, are written with this um, prefix apostrophe or, or prime. So um, the example there, arrow with the two type parameters char comma bool as the inputs and string as the output is the type char to bool to string. And so you can represent arbitrary arity functions in this arrow way. And then this generalized composition B um, composes a B to C function with an A's to B function for some arity A, so some number of arguments A's, and gives you an A's to C function. The A's to, A's to B uh, is then post-processed by the B to C. So that's not quite what you get in Haskell. There's some singleton types and, and stuff in there as well, but uh, it will do for, um, for the purposes of this talk. And you can ask me later if you want to find out more about that. So anyway, this is our CPS style evaluator. Uh, in the diff case, you evaluate the left hand side, get a result, call it M and so on. Um, I'm going to name the, the three uh, ways of constructing continuations there. Halt is the identity continuation, ret is what you do with literals, and the sub is what you do with diffs, because uh, I'm going to use those names later. And then um, using those names, uh, and this new generalized composition we've got, um, the recursive case, eval2 prime of the diff, uh, uses an arity1 and an arity2 composition. So uh, arity1 composition is just familiar function composition. Um, it's the thing that takes g of f and k and gives you g of f of k. Uh, arity2 composition is the one that takes a g and an f and a k and an m and applies f to k and m and then g to the result. So we can get rid of the lambdas and the arrows by using compositions instead. So eval of a diff is b1 of eval the left hand side of b2 of eval the right hand side of sub. So we can now plug that in and get uh, a different implementation of the evaluator. That's just using a different um, case, a different definition for the recursive case, the diff case. And this immediately uh, suggests tr some tree structured code. Uh, uh, and there's a picture of it here. Um, So the, look at the code on the left. Uh, um, so it's got a, a, a 3 minus 4 on the left, a 3 and a 4 and a sub on the left, and then you subtract 5 on the right from that. Um, that's represented by a data type, uh, which again is parameterized by arity, it's parameterized by a type index. So there are, uh, there are rets and there are subs, of course, but now there's also things to represent the B1s and the B2s. So, so there's four constructors, ret, sub, b1, and b2. Um, and they give you representations of expressions indexed by how many extra values you need in order to complete the evaluation, how many extra values you need in order to get the end result. 
So ret, ret n will give you a result with no extra values. So you need that's why it's got the empty list as the index. Sub will give you the result if you've got two at least two extra values. So you'll get a single result if you've got two extra values. And if you look at what the types of b1 and b2, then you'll see that the, 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 these are the argument types. So then you can turn your expressions into this representation that just turns lits into rets and diffs into b1s and b2s and, and subs. Um, and then you can interpret this representation um, just by uh, deforesting those constructors. So rets with a capital R turn into the function ret with a little r, subs with a capital S turn into the function sub. Those were the two um, basic continuations we introduced. B1s, capital B1 turns into little b1 and capital B2 turns into little b2. So obviously uh, ab6 after rep6 gives us um, the expression evaluator we had before, uh, just defunctionalizing all the constructors. So that's the picture here. Uh, the representation is the code with constructors, which is with capital letters in Haskell on the left, and the abstraction function replaces each of those with an interpretation, which is given a very similar name, and uh, this is uh, the evaluation of 3 minus 4 minus 5, done with generalized composition. But it's still tree-shaped, so uh, this is not going to give us uh, the linear program that we were hoping for, which was a list of instructions. This is a tree shaped thing. So, so this doesn't, target code isn't tree shaped. Target code is a linear sequence of instructions. So how does that come about? Well, of course, this generalized composition is associative, just like ordinary composition is. Um, in fact, it's pseudo associative because it's got these indices, different arities, and as you associate, the arities um, change. So the picture is given, uh, gives the idea, an arity R box F feeds into an arity S plus one box G, and then the result is given to H. And you can either plug together H and G and plug F into that, or you can plug together F and G and plug that into H. Uh, and they will, of course, give you the same result. The diagram is kind of proof of the fact that they will give you the same result. And then if you look at the arities, you'll see that uh, R's and S plus 1's turn into R plus S's and R. The indices change. But this is morally, H after G after F is the same as H after G after F. But what this associativity lets us do is rotate the tree shape code in this picture um, into linear code, which is what we want for the compiler. And uh, the calculation is really quite, quite pretty. Um, although it might be difficult to see what's going on here because everything looks the same. But let's look at our expression, 3 minus 4 minus 5, and the, the evaluator we had. So just plugging um, the definitions in, uh, we've got 3s and 4s, and uh, return 3 and a return 4 and then a sub, and then a return 5 and then a sub. And then eval is the sort of top-level function that uh, starts that off with the identity computation, uh, di identity continuation, which we, we introduce the name halt for. So B arity zero is just function application, just like B arity one is function composition. So now there's lots of Bs of different indices in there and we can just use associativity four times as it happens uh, and rearrange all that. And what we were trying to do is make sure that for every B, the left child has no more Bs in it and associativity lets us kind of rotate tree branches so that uh, all the nesting is down to the right. And we end up with uh, b0 of ret3, of b1 of ret4, of b0 of sub, of b1 of ret5, of b0 of sub, of halt. And, and that's right nested. There's no b's in any left child. So that gives you a, a different representation, again indexed by how many more things you need, but by construction uh, each recursive node in this data type has a single child, not two children. Um, so let's see, the, there's a picture. Um, this uh, this bret3, bret4, sub, bret5, uh, b sub, and then halt. So you get this linear structure. Um, 
captured by this data type. Again, the indices record how many more values you need in order to produce a result. The HALT program will give you a result if there's one integer lying around. Um, RET N um, uh, will give you, a, uh, if, if you have something that requires one R plus one more integers, then this will make something that only needs R more integers because you've just supplied the plus one. And the subtraction, uh, if you give it a continuation that deals with the result, then this is a continuation that deals with the two arguments. And again, we can directly interpret our um, uh, reps and uh, our expressions into this representation. Uh, we need to, uh, in the diff case, we need to get the program for the left side, the program for the right side, and then append those. So the append is on the next slide. Um, but then uh, abs the abstraction function just turns halts into halts, rets into rets, and subs into subs. Note again that you have to flip the arguments of subtraction because you push the left child onto the stack and then the right child onto the stack. Uh, the appending program is some more uh, Haskell type class um, hackery. Um, but So this is just appending type level lists and then appending uh, these arbitrarity functions, um, or the, uh, uh, appending the representations as programs. And so we end up with a, uh, a representation, like on the left here, and the abstraction function just interprets the B ret as a B, zero, as a B something and a ret, uh, the sub as a B something and a sub, and the halt as a halt. Um, and so this is the, uh, uh, the linear shape program. And this is where the compiler comes from. So uh, the, uh, the, the compiler now turns our expression into a list of instructions by turning the expression into this linear representation and then turning that representation into instructions. Compile rep seven does the latter step. So the whole program is the empty list of instructions uh, ret with a continuation k is a push followed by the code you get from k and sub with a continuation k is a sub instruction followed by the code that you get from k and um, that should say compile seven of expression if you if you uh, evaluate this expression if you evaluate this compiler on our example expression then you do indeed get the same program as before push three push four sub push five sub uh, as a list of instructions. And that's all I wanted to say. Um, uh, I've shown you continuation passing style and defunctionalization. They're really applications of this, this more general idea of accumulating parameters, where you um, add an additional argument to a function and the result accumulates in that argument when it makes recursive calls. And then when you get to the end, the place where you've accumulated the result is the eventual result. These two steps, CPS and defunctionalization, came out of a very nice paper by John Reynolds uh, from 1972, Definitional Interpreters for Higher Order Programming Languages. I really recommend you read that. It's a, it's a classic. And then the approach has been picked up by uh, Olivier Donvy in a long series of papers about unpacking how that relates to interpreters and abstract machines. Um, uh, so Olivier works through lots of examples of, of Reynolds techniques to show how uh, this, this construction explains where various of our abstract machines come from, um, uh, which interpreters they correspond to. And as we've seen, there's many more uh, applications. It's not just about abstract machines. So we've seen reverse, we've seen traversals, we've seen zippers. Uh, there are lots of other applications too. But what I hope I've uh, impressed upon you is that there's uh, usually some appeal to associativity in there. And associativity, uh, like many other algebraic properties, is, um, uh, is a very important part of programs. In fact, it's the essence of doing one thing after another. Uh, that is, sequential composition is associative. So it's not surprising, perhaps, that uh, it's, um, uh, it's so crucial here. But it's often overlooked, and these algebraic properties are often overlooked. And uh, I want to encourage you to think about those algebraic properties when you're writing programs and when you're defining abstractions. What are the uh, 
equations that your abstractions satisfy. So um, thanks very much for your attention. I'm going to stop there uh, and um, I'm very happy to answer any questions and fill in any gaps that there wasn't time to cover uh, in the recorded talk and see you over virtual coffee. Thank you.